Welcome to Let's Talk Science. My name is Nancy Nijelski. We are incredibly lucky to have today's speaker. You've probably heard the term six degrees of separation. Well, I found out that our speaker is only three degrees of separation from me, which is part of why we have him here today. When I asked Dr. Pierre Murard how he wanted me to introduce himself, his modesty offered more information about the topic he's going to cover than about himself. So I did some research, and now I'm going to tell you what he wasn't going to tell you about himself. Dr. Murard is a UW professor of engineering and mathematics and a professor of neurological surgery. He's an adjunct professor in the departments of bioengineering, radiology, and pediatric dentistry, and an affiliate in the Applied Physics Lab. His research interest is bioengineering principles, particularly diagnostic and therapeutic ultrasound to make scientific and therapeutic advances in neurosurgery. His research includes application of ultrasound to diagnose and treat central nervous system disease and novel means of imaging brain diseases and disorders. He holds several patents, one of which I found kind of fun. It relates to battery-powered toothbrushes. <laughs> and today he's going to be talking about your brain on art. So please join me in giving him a big welcome. That stuff makes me blush. So, um, but it's true, I, I do all those things. Uh, turns out my PhD mentor is here, Bob Brown. A little bit more like that? How's that? Sure. Okay, here we go. Um, thank you very much. So, my mentor, my PhD mentor, Bob Brown, is in the audience, sitting right there. Um, I, yeah, round of applause for Bob Brown, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, he, I have a PhD in applied math, as it turns out, nothing to do with neurosurgery and engineering. And my PhD involved math applied to atmospheric sciences, which was his thing. I then went on to do other things that got me connected to other departments. And I have a fun little image here of a variety of devices that I've helped invent. And they're in the space of brain just as Nancy kindly pointed out, in the space of uh, diagnostics or therapeutics for the brain, and somehow my toothbrush didn't make it on there. I invented the Ultrio toothbrush, which was uh, involved ultrasound and, and rapid movement of bristles. It was really fun. So um, I like to work on problems that have a chance of Im having impact on people in my lifetime. So I've moved around from project to project looking for a sweet spot where I could make a difference. But that's not what I'm here to talk to you about today. I invented a class up at UW Bothell campus that um, is an introductory class to neurobiology where I asked students to learn enough about neurobiology so they could have a chance of understanding how their brain works when they have an aesthetic experience. And I start the class, I won't take the kind of time I take in class, but I start the class by saying, how many people have had rice? Most people raised their hands. How many people, is rice a, uh, an important part of their culture? And just about everyone raises their hand. And so we have this long discussion about rice. Uh, someone from Colombia, maybe they have raisins in it. Someone from um, Ghana, maybe they have yams in it. It goes back and forth. They often talk about their mother's cooking of rice. And they wind up having a deep knowledge and then emotional connection to rice. And that's my way of spending 20 minutes with them to trick them into realizing that they enjoy rice. It gives them pleasure. In essence, it's an aesthetic experience. And because of that and some other studies that I could summarize here, um, artifacts damage brains. Uh, damaged brains produce different kinds of art. Um, Art evokes all kinds of stuff in the brain. Basically, it's a brain-centric view of aesthetics that is the basis of this class, where I 
talk about something called the neuroesthetic triad, and that's what it is right there. Uh, I didn't invent this, someone else did. Where basically, a mo if it, your joy, for example, upon seeing a sunset, is informed by light hitting your eyes and then going into your brain. Um, you probably have some base feeling associated with seeing a sunset in general. You probably have memories associated with sunsets, hence even more emotion. And that gamish comes together and creates that moment where you have sublimity or joy. So at a very high level, um, this, this is what you, what, when you eat your rice pudding, which for me, I grew up on. So when I eat rice pudding, it's an aesthetic event for me. I grew up in the Northeast, so in New Jersey. Uh, I could tell you different kinds of rice pudding and all the rest of it. And it, Memories of growing up, going to the diner with my folks in the morning, Sunday morning, and having rice pudding, it's a great memory. Um, it tastes good, at least to me. And uh, I know something about it, but in addition to my history, so I love it. So the point of the class then, I'm essentially walking through you through my syllabus, is to teach people some neurobiology, uh, theories of aesthetics, which I don't hit them with too much because they're too busy just experiencing things. They're 20, right? You know, um, What the brain does in response to art, architecture, good food, what all those things can do to brain when the brain's healthy, when the brain's not so healthy. Uh, I gave a, a lecture on uh, how to alter your brain, including ways that help you appreciate art more. Turns out there are ways of doing that. And uh, the students give an uh, inordinate number of presentations. They read some of the scientific literature. They speak in public, and they learn how to work in teams. I mean, these are freshmen. These are people who were in high school uh, last year. And we all know uh, COVID made school just a little bit challenging for some of these people as well as for their teachers, trust me. So we, there's some basic things that we're asking them to learn as well as the specifics to the class, but I have a secret learning outcome, which I tell them, of course, but they forget. But the secret outcome is I want them to learn about how they experience something wonderful so they have a better chance of appreciating something wonderful even more. And... Um, they hear that several times during the course. So it's one thing to say, wow, that's a nice sunset. It's another, th or I don't know, Mrs. Fields cookies, for example, but it's another thing to have some insight into the recipe, to have uh, experiences with Mrs. Fields cookies with different kinds of hot chocolate, or hot chocolate with vodka, or you know, whatever you want to do, right? So, um, and those memories, as well as the immediate experience and all the associated emotions, if they're aware that all this is happening to them, when something is happening to them, I think they'll have a better experience. More joy, and joy is a good thing. So uh, I'm gonna show you an uh, example of a PowerPoint presentation, it's five slides, that a group of students put together after I taught them about the neuroesthetic triad, the, what I just overviewed. In this case, these are seniors, because I, sometimes I give a guest lecture in a, say, a survey of neurobiology class. And so um, they'll speak, you'll see a practical example of the neuroesthetic triad. And these students love gelato, it turns out. And how could you not love gelato? Um, certainly I do. And so they, they went very gestalt, which I really liked. They showed a bunch of images, excuse me, on a humid summer evening. It's a good time for gelato. And they have identified their favorite gelato store. They're at a, a beach where the gelato store is, and they're watching the sunset in this case. They have various flavors. They're with friends. And so there's the part of the aesthetics of eating gelato where you have to eat it. You, know, you get it scooped into something. It's in your hand. Um, you see it. And then, well, you taste it. So they threw a little bit of neurobiology there about the, you know, their different the tongue. That's a tongue. Sorry about that. And um, different flavors. They talked about the different nerves. And they talked about the propagation of taste from the tongue through the correct nerve into the into 
see if they got that right. The thalamus, good for them, into the insula, somatocentric cortex. So they learned enough neurobiology to figure out where that signal goes from tongue into awareness, which is a big part of the neurobiology of this class. They talked a lot about the, what they knew and what they've experienced about gelato. People have their favorite flavors. I happen to like pistachio very much. Uh, when I was in Florence years ago, I, I made it a goal to eat gelato at every gelato place I saw, which was about three or four times a day. And I, and I settled on cantaloupe as my favorite flavor, and it was glorious, just, just marvelous. And I had accumulated, I don't know, 18 to 20 different experiences of cantaloupe gelato, so I had formed a real opinion about what I thought was good, as well as some pre-diabetes. But, you know, that's another, <laughs> that's another matter. Um, so people bring knowledge, they experience gelato in this case in a context, and um, I love this one. Um, if you go with friends, you've gone with more than once, and you have a history of gelato with them, and that history of an experience with people you care about can, can inform the present experience, and that's important, very important. So there are the different flavors they like. Um, these are their examples. And then there's the emotion. You, you, you can, this just physiology, you feel warm, for example, and all the rest of it. You're going to go get a gelato. And um, sometimes you might feel nostalgia and contentment. Nostalgia because you've done this before. Contentment because it's damn good right now. It's really good right now. Um, and they even went to the into the reward circuit a little bit and talked about the difference between wanting gelato and liking gelato. So we've had long discussions about the difference between wanting and liking and a little sidebar here for uh, drug addicts, they will want something but not necessarily like it, and which is part of the problem they have. The want becomes overwhelming even if they don't like it. Um, so they, they talk about, they did all the right things here. They, they, interleaved some neurobiology with the experience. You know, they had only had me for two hours before they put this together. And then they summarized it in a very pretty picture of eating gelato by the water when the sun is setting. So in the first part of the class for the freshmen, this takes us, I don't know, four weeks to get to this part, three or four weeks, meeting two hours a day, twice a week. Because um, I really want them to think deeply about it. But then we get into more complex neurobiology because it just wouldn't be enough of a science class if I didn't actually look at some of the neurobiology. And so we spend a fair bit of time on the visual circuit. So how is it that we actually see? It turns out it's not so straightforward like, oh, I see something. There's always a lag, for example, t tens to 50 milliseconds, for example, so a little less than a tenth of a second. And there's a whole bunch of work as to how is it that we could navigate through the world when the world, our experience of the world is delayed by a fraction of a second. And that's a whole nother talk. Let's just say uh, there's a portion of our brain always predicting what's likely to happen given what it's just learned. And then it corrects itself. So there are two parts. There's a serial part, stuff happens in sequence, and another part that happens in parallel. So I'm going to give you guys a test. Think about this and tell me how many triangles you see. I got four, I got a zero, 12, seven or eight, two. Could be zero, right? Could be zero, okay, cool. Um, it's a, your brain, it turns out, some people's brain, stitch together the missing pieces and build more and more triangles. Your visual system is built to infer. That's a feature of your, your visual system. All right. Tell me what you see in blue there. Uh, I heard a 13. Let's go with 13, but I did hear a B. So it turns out there's a portion of your brain that looks at things in context. And that works in parallel with the portion of your brain that basically fills in lines. And so a lot of what we experience is our brain 
anticipating something, especially the line filling in part, and filling it in. It's probably, there's probably some triangles there. So uh, with the students, we'll go into more detail and all the different bits that take uh, a photon. See, is that? That's kind of there. Uh, imagine someone sees a cartoon face while well, the photons hit the eye. It activates uh, the retinal nerve. Signals propagate to the back of the brain. Turns out they cross and turn things upside down. Who knew? And um, that's a sequential processing where these lines, these grid lines get filled in, for example. That's a place where that happens. But there's also stuff that happens in parallel. Like what is it or who is it that you're looking for? Uh, where is it? for example. That all happens in a different part of the brain, in fractions of a second before you become aware of what's out there. And so the net effect is that photons enter in from the eye, generate a signal that propagates to the back of your brain, and then that signal splits into uh, the bottom part, which is the what pathway. Is it a horse? Is it your neighbor? Uh, and the where pathway. Well, it's over there, or it's down below. And then all that eventually comes together, again, in a fraction of a second, to the front part of your brain where, you, where your awareness is. And you go, oh, I see Bob Brown, my former mentor, right there. And if I look away, and I do it again, it turns out he's still there. And it happens that quickly. And they're specialized for the what part. There's some specialized pieces, like the, the fusiform gyrus that helps identify faces. You don't see a, need to see a lot of face in order to identify, in this case, Ram, Rembrandt. So there's a, a self-portrait by Rembrandt, very beautiful, a lot of chiaroscuro there. And here, essentially, is a line drawing that emphasizes just the, the main features. But we could still, many of us could still recognize that person as a person, that set of lines as a person, and a meaningful subset of us could probably recognize that as Rembrandt. So there are specialized pieces for that kind of thing. There are specialized pieces for emotion. That's the amygdala. It's right near there. There are specialized pieces for color. And uh, short-term memory, working memory, are all right smack there. So my experience of Bob Brown, for example, right now, who I haven't seen in decades, nearly brings me to tears, quite frankly, good tears, because uh, of the, all the stuff that we did together and because neurobiologically, in my brain is a Bob Brown and all the experiences we've had, all the joys, and I caused him some sorrows, I'm sure, so we got some sorrows there, right? Uh, and I, I see him, and that's what happens moment by moment in the brain for the visual system. So when we have optical illusions, like with the triangles or like with the numbers, or what seemed like an optical illusion when I saw Bob Brown walk in, um, there are parts of the brain that essentially like, fill in the lines. That's a computational part of the brain. And then there's the contextual part. There's stuff in the visual system only, or there's stuff in more than the visual system. There's the processing of a what, and there's a processing of where. And I teach the freshmen this, and I have another 15 optical illusions I have them experience. And um, they really get to spend some time with that. And essentially, we have a computation-based optical illusion on the left and a context one, knowledge one, on the right. Then when you go to art history, uh, a classic example are the pointillists, for those of you who remember your art history. Um, I suppose it's most obvious to you here. What the artists did was they put a dab of paint of a given color wherever they wanted. They didn't draw lines. They put little pixels worth of colors. They wouldn't have called them pixels then. Uh, pointillists is what they're called. There's a rather famous one. It took them a lot of work, I'm sure. But because our visual system is inclined to create patterns, out of this collection of points, you come really close, you just see points of different colors, out of this collection come shapes like boats and uh, churches and people standing uh, in a park. Because our visual system constructs the world in a sense. It takes raw input and tries to make sense of it. And by an example, again, is pointillism. So um, 
we go from this simple view of the world where, of the neurobiology of aesthetics, where, well, there's kind of some bit where senses happen. You might feel something, you see something, you taste something. There's what we know and what we feel. And then we dig deeper, and the same kind of explication I gave you for the visual system, I talk about taste and smell. And then we get into what, um, is a simplified view of the central and peripheral nervous system. And God bless them, these freshmen don't completely freak out. <laughs> and so we're at week seven or so in the class. And we, we've talked about all the different ways the eyes and the sense of smell connect either in the spinal cord, number nine below, or, or the temporal lobe, number four. Let's see if I remember that right, no, number eight. And I then ask him to think about experiences, really basic experiences with this in mind. And this takes a good two weeks. So for example, I see a cookie there. If I'd known he was here, I would have said, I see Bob Brown there. And I say, okay, what's the order of events that happens in your brain that's associated with this sentence, I see a cookie there? We had long discussions about, are you always self-aware? And we decided, yes. But remember, with the visual system, the photons hit your eyes, and it takes a while before you have awareness. So through lots of discussion and back and forth, we wind up coming up with something like this. We have a sense of self. The verb to see comes first, because all this visual processing occurs. And maybe you recognize that something is there and eventually it's a cookie. Or maybe you recognize it's a cookie simultaneously with there. Maybe the sentence really should be, I see, I see something, it's a cookie, it's over there. And then they, we write an order of events that happens based upon these numbers in this neuroanatomy. Um, there's lots of discussion with this because they, they don't believe it, quite frankly. But, but we, 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 I walk about like, what if you want something? What if you like something? I'm so sorry, ma'am, and I'm glad you're correcting me. Thank you. So um, I'll I drift. Um, I'll summarize the last 90 seconds by simply saying that for the students, they just want to say, I see a cookie there. But from a neurobiological perspective, um, it's more complex than that. Maybe you see the cookie, but don't understand where it is. Maybe you identify the table that it's on, and then eventually identify it as a cookie. Maybe you think it's an aardvark, and eventually you call it a cookie. And in all cases, there's a lot going on between the seeing and the actual identification of it. So um, interleaved with these discussions about the neurobiology of seeing or tasting or what have you, we do talk about art. And I noticed walking in that um, you have a, at least a, a poster of a Rothko, if not an actual Rothko. Don't know. And so, um, one sec. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, we talk about how prior knowledge might affect your experience of a piece of art. And Rothko is a great idea. He's this New York artist. He was around some time ago. And he's actually rather famous for some very abstract pieces of art that are basically bands of color. And they're big pieces, very big, five to seven feet tall, three, four feet wide. Uh, beautiful painterly technique. Um, it, it, I believe it's oil, but it looks like watercolor. Um, I've had the, the honor of uh, and joy of seeing some up close and personal when I visited my family in the Northeast and uh, very painterly, very gorgeous, rich colors. Yeah, but what the heck am I looking at, right? So, um, it's beautiful. I mean, I'm, it's, it evokes spec skepticism, quite frankly. Like, what the heck is it? But it also is just the colors, the techniques are gorgeous. But what is it? So, um, there's a wonderful book by a Nobel Prize winner who talks about art and the visual system, and I've stolen these slides from him. And the question arises, 
how did he get there? Wow. So in, later in life, he started painting stuff like this. Like, what the heck? So turns out a study of his work shows some of his early work, which is rather representational. I think it's fair to say, still quirky. But I think we would both agree that there are two human beings standing there, and they're plausibly holding hands, or at least walking side by side. And this is an early example of his work. You could see that there are people there. Sometime later, the work is getting more abstract. I think it's fair to say abstract, but I think we could still agree. I, I suspect a plurality of us would agree that there are two people in this image. And perhaps they're kissing, perhaps they're just smashing their faces together, and sometimes it's hard to tell the difference, if I remember right. And he called it couples kissing, which is a good clue for me. <laughs> Later on, he painted that. Perhaps there are two people there. He calls it uh, number one of 1948. So this is 10 years later. Um, I don't think I'm going out on a limb to say this is an, a relatively abstract painting. And from what I've read about his art, he's wanted to reduce form to its essence. That's what, that was the artistic problem he was trying to solve. And so from there, he went to there. So my question for you, I'd love to hear some answers, is understanding this trajectory of the artist, having this information, does it in any way, A, inform, and B, affect how you respond to his latest work, which is the work you see on your right? Is anyone willing to comment? Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. I'll try to say that back since I'm the one with the microphone. And the one on the left, he said, eh, some people, who cares? I'm going to paraphrase. And the one on the right, she went on a riff for, it looks like a glass of uh, a, a complex beverage, uh, two or three different levels, and it looks delicious. And I will add, it looks like a B-52 to me, for those keeping score. <laughs> um, so what's a B-52? Grand Marnier, Kalur, and Bailey's, I think, if I remember right. So... Um, yeah, I, for me, imagination. all imagination. It allows the viewer to bring more to the art, which is another driver for those doing abstract painting. But he came to it by trying to solve the problem of what is the essence of a figure. And f there's various kinds of art. Jazz, for example. Knowing the artist's trajectory can help you hear what they're trying to do, and instead of it just sounding cacophonous, it might actually sound good or interesting. Of course, it might just sound like crap anyway. <laughs> so art affects the brain and brain affects the art. I'm going to talk to you about Alzheimer's disease. For those keeping score at home, uh, Alzheimer's disease is an example of a dementia. Um, this graph shows uh, patient age years and just a, some metric for the likelihood that you're going to get Alzheimer's disease. So you should know that Alzheimer's disease is one of several dementias. It's, it's diagnosed about half the time, half to three quarters of the time. But upon clinical examination after the fact, it's only present in its pure form a quarter of the time. There are other kinds of dementia, vascular dementia or combinations thereof that are about three quarters, maybe 80% of it. And uh, take home message, which I give to my students, um, take care of your heart now. If you take care of your heart, you're going to take care of your brain. Keep your cardiovascular health high. That'll keep your cerebrovascular health high. There's some other things you can do. Be social. This is a social place, right? That's what I'm told by Nancy. Very social. And that will help. So um, this is an artist who I didn't know about before who 
did self-portraits self-portrait, throughout his life. And fairly realistic in the 60s. And then he started to lose it in the 90s. If you go from left to right in top row, then bottom row, um, it's a sad trajectory, truly. But he had enough wherewithal to still do self-portraits. Much more famous example is de Kooning, an abstract artist. Um, big, big, big paintings, swirls, washes of color, like Rothko in that um, they're contemporaries, as a matter of fact. I think he was a little bit later. Uh, very much um, evocative as opposed to representative. And he had well-documented dementia going well into his artistic career. And uh, he had problems with memory, uh, he, uh, problems with sleep, but he still wound up painting paintings that are more or less recognizable as a de Kooning. And then it gets really interesting because for de Kooning and Jas, um, I'm spacing on the other guy's name. Um, no, no, he, he was the painter who uh, splashed paint all over the place. Pollock, thank you, thank you. I have better slides in, in a talk I gave on this the other day. People started mathematically analyzing the patterns of splash or the patterns of complexity in there to see if they could tell the difference between a, a real, a, a known, authenticated, say, de Kooning or um, a fake one. It was hard to sell, but hard to tell. But what was true is that those mathematical representations did evolve with time that tied with his uh, clinical condition. So one's clinical condition can affect one's art. Now, there's a counterexample to that. Some of you might have seen this. Let's see if I could do this all with just one hand. I hope it's not too loud. So we'll just kick back for a minute. I have one resident that barely opened her eyes. She didn't respond. As much as I tried, I knew her for two years. No matter what I tried, massage wouldn't work, nothing worked. But when we got introduced to the iPods and the family told me the things that she liked, it was amazing once we put the iPod on her. She started shaking her feet. She started moving her, her head. Her son was just amazed. Okay, can we stop? Because now I'm getting all our, <laughs> I'm seeing her all over again. How long has he been in the nursing home? Uh, approximately 10 years. He was having seizures, and my mother couldn't handle him at home. Of course, it affected me greatly, because he was always, you know, fun-loving, singing, you know, every occasion he would come out with a song, no matter where he was. I remember as a child, he used to walk us down the street, me and my brother, and he would stop and do singing in the rain. He would have us jumping and swinging around poles. He was, you know, he was good. He was always into music, you know. He always loved singing, dancing. His name is Henry Drea. Uh-huh. And I'm looking more or less for religious music for him. Okay. Because he enjoys music and he always quotes in the Bible. So I'd rather have that for him. We first see Henry inert, maybe depressed, unresponsive, and almost unalive. Yeah. Henry. Yes, yeah, so. dog. I found your music. Uh, you want you want your music now? Well, you okay, let's, let's try your music, okay? And then you tell me if it's too loud or not. Then he is given an iPod containing, we know, his favorite music. <laughs> Yeah. 
and immediately he, he lights up. His face assumes expression, his eyes open wide. He, uh, he starts to, um, to sing and to rock and to move his arms and he's being animated by the music. And he used to always sit on the unit with his head like this. He didn't really talk to much people. And then when I introduced the music to him, this is his, his reaction ever since. <laughs> The philosopher Kant once called music the quickening art, and Henry is being quickened, he's being brought to life. Yeah. I'm going to take the music for one second, okay? Just huh? to ask you a few questions. Okay? Thank you. I'm going to give it back to you. Here's uh -huh. the most amazing okay. part. The effect of this doesn't stop, because when the, uh, the, the headphones are taken off, uh, Henry, normally mute and virtually unable to answer the simplest yes or no questions, is quite voluble. Henry. Yeah. Um, do you like the iPod? Do you like the music you're hearing? Yes. Tell me about your music. Well, I don't, I don't, don't, I don't have one. I mean, it, it, uh, do you like music? Yeah, I'm crazy about music. You play beautiful music, beautiful sound, did beautiful. You, did you play music when you were, uh, were you, did you like music when you were young? Yes, yes, I went to big dances and things. W what was your favorite music when you were young? Uh, well, uh, well, I guess, uh, well, Cab Calloway was my number one band guy I liked. That the little holy, the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy. What was your fav favorite Cab Calloway song? Oh, I'll be on the for Christmas. Oh, you can count plans on me with plenty of snow. Mr. Joe, present, Reverend, you three, ow. So in some sense, Henry is restored to himself. He has uh, uh, remembered uh, who he is, and uh, he's, he's reacquired his, his identity for a while through the power of music. What, what does music do, do to you? Give me the feeling of love, no, no mass. Figure right now the world needs to come into music, singing. You got beautiful music here, beautiful, oh lovely. And uh, I feel the band of love, dream. Lord came. I suspect many of you have seen that, but not all, and um, it moves even the hardest hearts of my freshman students. And many of them know, have family members, I should say, who are in or near this state. And my hope, my hope is that it gives them, my hope is that it gives them, well, more insight and more love. That's my hope for them. And I hope it uh, also makes them exercise more and eat better, quite, fr quite frankly. So we're at this stage of the quarter where I want them to integrate what they have uh, experienced. <clears throat> and I'm not a traditional teacher. I don't like to lecture much. So I, I'm told to stand here so I'm in the camera, and that's not how I operate. But I'm, I'm doing it. So um, remember, these are freshmen in high school, fr freshmen in college just out of high school. So it's fall, right? So this is their, I'm their, God bless them, I'm their first experience of a college professor. So I say the final project is come up with a fanciful creature, could be anything, and tell me what is an possibly an aesthetic experience for it. I'll give you some examples in a, I'll give you some examples in a minute. And then work out what bits of brain would it have to have in order to have that experience. So um, I'll show you my version of that, the version that motivated me to create this class, actually. Uh, it's about trilobites. And so I, this is a creature that lived and died half a billion years ago or so in the Cambrian Sea. 
And uh, I say, your title slide should tell me what it is and make sure you have a clever title, not to say trilobites, something germane. So I chose Pleasure for a Creepy Creature. And, and what motivated me to think about this class was an article I read in Nature now some years ago, probably eight to 10 years ago, where I learned that these creatures, which are very much like horseshoe crabs or crabs in general, they had crystalline eyes like flies. So flies' eyes are faceted. And so it's like they have a retina on the outside of their eye as well as they process things on the inside. And I remember reading this article, knowing that trilobites lived in shallow water. And I've, many of us, I'm sure, have swum underwater and have, with eyes open before the salt stings too much, for example. And it's beautiful. And I'll, I'll show you some example of the light that it can create. And I said to myself, I wonder if it's beautiful to a trilobite. And I said to myself, well, of course, the trilobite doesn't have much of a brain to do that. Uh, on the right is a horseshoe crab. It's nervous system. There's not much going on there. But I said, well, what would it have to have to enjoy that? And that got me thinking about the neurobiology of art. And there is literature on that, which I've taken for this class. And it, what I invented, created first for the class, was this final project. So for, I asked him to have a clever title slide. I asked him to describe what's germane to their aesthetic experience. So this is one such slide. They have crystalline eyes. They live in shallow water. If you've swum in shallow water, you have seen light dapple through the water. The waves refract the light, so it's brighter in some places and less bright in other places. And these are examples of turtles off of Maui swimming in that kind of ocean lit by uh, light that is refracted through the ocean surface. Uh, some of these bright bands are because that's what their shells look like. Some of them are because of the light. And if this were a movie, you would see that light dappling. <clears throat> I then asked the students to make a haiku. They've probably been making haiku since middle school, so they came up with an haiku, and I came up with one. Alive in the now, trilobites live awash in roiling wet sparkles. <clears throat> so I made them do some art. Not a lot of art, but I made them do some art. Then I want them to describe an aesthetic event in words. And you could see mine here. I see my friend in front of me, awash in dawn's entrancing, sparkling light. I swim to him joyfully. And then I ask them, because they've been playing with this now for three, four weeks, to try to translate a sentence or two like that into a sequence of events, some of which are parallel, some of which occur in series, based upon this neurobiology. And these are poor freshmen. They always work in groups. And they've been thinking about this kind of thing for about four weeks now. Every day, we work on a problem like this. And I say, well, let's make it start easy. Start with the triad and pick the numbers off the graph that are germane to sensory sensation or movement, what you know or what you've learned and what you feel. And then I give them this one, which is way too complex for them. And I'm not going to walk you through it too much, but let's just say that um, I, the black part talks about the vision piece, trilobite, CI, and it's in front of me. So that's how the visual system works. So I had to bring in my long-term memory of what a trilobite is, because otherwise I wouldn't know what it is. It's in my working memory. So that takes care of the what part and then the where part. Well, it's my friends over there. And then the other piece is I have to appreciate that there's light, that it's light in the morning. I have an emotional response to it. I find it entrancing, hence beautiful. It's sparkling. And that's what all the rest of this, I believe, speaks to. Now, the nice thing about this class is I don't have to prove this, right? This, this is what I, it's plausible. And they might come up with a different order. And when I grade them on this assignment, if it's a different order, but their argument is sensible, they're fine. And I swimmed him joyfully is a little bit easier. Different parts of the brain again. 
and it's a little bit shorter. Uh, I, I had given them the neurobiology of inducing movement. I had given them uh, essentially all these things, and they just have to know to add some emotion piece, essentially, which I've done in other contexts, so it's not too hard. So um, by thinking about trilobites 500 million years ago, it got me thinking about the neurobiology of experiences. And using other people's work, I've developed a class based upon this. This whole neuro circuit thing is, is my own, to be fair. Um, I'm sure other people would have different neuro circuits, but this is what I've chosen. And um, my view of a pleasant aesthetic experience is one where we have an emotion. It's informed by everything I've just told you, of course. There are typically some kind of input, some kind of sensation. Although as a mathematician, I do like beautiful math, and that's all up here, typically. But typically some kind of input or memory. It's tagged with, in this moment with emotion. It's tagged with other memories. Um, wanting and liking, <clears throat> and all that comes together in an iterative fashion to create an aesthetic event. That's how I look at it. And for my students, I will keep emphasizing, I'll keep, for my students, I'll keep emphasizing <clears throat> that I hope upon learning more about how their biology leads to an aesthetic experience will actually lead to a more, inf more joyous and deeper held aesthetic experience. And that's why I teach the class. So I want to thank Nancy for uh, giving me the opportunity to come here. She has helped uh, my girlfriend and helped a dear friend who's not long for the world, I'm sorry to say. And it's a, a delight for me to come and give back uh, as a very much a thank you to Nancy, who's uh, clearly a leader in her field and a leader at this place. So thank you very much. A round of applause for Nancy, please. Uh, excuse me, no round of applause for you, Pierre. I mean, so questions? Any questions? You keep using the word beauty. Now, how do you come to that conclusion that something is beautiful? Well, I. I was afraid you're going to ask me to define beauty, which is a harder problem. Yeah. Um, let's go back a couple slides. So, how do I? How is it that I've come to um, thinking I can talk about beauty and what what's it all about? I think something that's beautiful is something that our brain puts together through these different mechanisms. Part of that definition? Does joy have to be part of this definition of, of an aesthetic beauty. event more broadly, beauty? Well, um, there's some really. So th there, there were two gentlemen in history named Francis Bacon that I know of. One was a philosopher, kind of early science guy. But another was an artist out of Ireland about 70 years ago or so. And his work, I'm hard pressed to call it beautiful. Um, I might get my act together and bring up a, an image here, but um, it's striking and intriguing and disturbing, and his technique is amazing, and I have an aesthetic experience when I see it, but I can't say that it's beautiful, and the feelings I have go much more than joy. So. The young lady in the back who talked about the Rothko and how it reminded her of a drink, um, a part of her aesthetic experience of that Rothko painting was analysis, was thinking, was brought into it. So I don't think one has to have joy, but I think most of the time that happens. That's, that's my Weasley answer to your very important question. Um, I don't have the microphone. I guess back there they have the microphone. Yeah. Uh, first, I want to thank you for an absolutely enlightening um, talk and demonstration. I'm a clinical psychologist working in a similar arena, 
unfortunately got too old too soon because I could never remember all this stuff, but it was in the area of pain. But in here, in assisted living, uh, brought in um, uh, um, instrumental music, drums, all kinds of, because the primitive brain is more associated with rhythm than with melody. And anyway, I had the same experiences here. However, what also struck me was, and this is on the positive side, these are positive emotions, joy, beauty, etc that it doesn't seem to take much to make the same system fit terrible things, like what's going on in a country, uh, what's going on in the world now. Most of us have looked at the stuff that is going on in Israel between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And I get those same kind of integrated reactions at different levels of explanation that are associated with horror, with depression, with disgust, and I wonder how you, uh, uh, right, that only we would call that unesthetic experiences, that, you know, we should never see such things. And, uh, and I wonder what makes one set of people pleased to do the, what I would call the negative aspect of this, and one set of people pleased to do the positive aspect. A, a, a profoundly important question that, of course, I can't give you the definitive answer to. But, but I would say, however, that one's experience of the world broadly is informed by what you see and what you learn, sorry, what comes at you, what information you bring to that experience, and what emotion you have, be it positive or negative. I think uh, one can argue that an aesthetic experience is one that's a net positive, and you get to decide, based in large part on your history and what you can sense that something is a positive experience. Uh, you mentioned the political world today. I'm not going to go into politics, but there are people on various sides in emotional response to what's happening in Gaza and Israel. And there's a lot of history there at a, at a minimum. So there's a whole lot of this going on. So I think that's the answer. If there are different parts of brain that are connected by circuits that are in balance with various weights. And sometimes the experiences can dominate. Um, we'll go to a more neutral topic, uh, drug addiction, for example. The, the feeling of wanting can overwhelm your decisions that would otherwise keep you away from taking yet another opioid or what have you. My, I had a friend now dead who was a heroin addict. And he would tell me about it. It was just felt so good, it was so wonderful. And he overdosed. So um, I talk to the students at length about circuits, and it scares them to look at you know, all those circuits, right? But this, trust me, this is a very simplified view of, of how people currently understand how the brain works, and you would know that. Uh, but an important process in college, I'm going to circle back on this and finish, is do you have a growth mindset? Do you feel like your brain is fixed? You're never going to learn anything? Or can you learn? Turns out the answer is you can learn. And uh, you have to understand, to help some people to understand, it helps to understand, rather, that there are different parts of the brain that are in balance in different ways, with different weights. And learning can change how one portion of the brain influences another. And I think because the brain is plastic in how it acts from day to day. We have this base person, but still, we can respond day to day. That's how some people can learn, how some people can have one response to a given piece of art, like Francis Bacon and, and horror. That's my long-winded answer to your excellent question. Hi. Hi. Um, have you ever used art or aesthetic um, aesthetics to heal parts of the well, I'm not a clinician, I'm just a researcher and teacher. I, if I had to do it over again, I would have done an MD, PhD, and, and actually gotten to touch patients. I've done research where I've done so. Uh, no, I, I well, um, I've developed some virtual and augmented reality projects that put people who've had a stroke in a new environment where they feel motivated, for example, to move their arm that they otherwise have trouble moving, they're playing a game, they love it. But the usual 
exercises they're supposed to do in order to make their arm move are deathly dull. So I guess in that sense, I've, with my students, I've created aesthetic experiences that wind up having a therapeutic effect. So I guess yes is the answer. Not quite art, though, trust me. Uh, there's a gentleman up front here. Some years ago, a mathematician claimed that Pollock's art was fractal. Mm -hmm. And that some of the, looking at the ones that he chose not to show, they weren't fractal. Is that plausible? How could he have recognized that they were or were not fractal? And why would he have cared? Yeah. So I, I didn't show you an example of Jackson Pollock, but imagine you have a 10 foot by 10 foot painting and cans of paint that you dip a brush into and just throw the paint against, throw the paint against the canvas. And you circle it and you do it, you do it, you do it. Um, my friend uh, Mandelbrot, who I didn't know but I'd met, uh, came up with the term fractal probably after Pollock did his work. So I'm pretty sure Jackson didn't know anything about fractals. But other people have come upon his work after the fact and essentially asked, are there large scale movements of the paint and small scale movements? And do they follow something called a power law of some sort that they're, they're kind of, well, th there's a range of sizes of things in his paintings and they tend to fall off in time. But when you zoom in, Locally, there's still the same kind of relationship. So uh, in point of fact, he painted in a fractal-like way. And people have used fractal analysis to try to identify which of his alleged art pieces, posthumously, of course, are actually the, one, actually the ones that he made. And fractals can be quite beautiful, quite, quite beautiful. In, we look for pattern, and our brains try to impose pattern when we can, and the example of that uh, set of triangles, or ledger triangles. Mm. Sir, in the back. Yeah, in your entire presentation, I never heard you once use the word dopamine. Or is it to be taken for granted? Is it irrelevant? Is it what? So uh, dopamine plays a role, among other places, in the reward center. And I have a whole hour plus lecture on wanting versus liking. So the reward center here is right there, 4, 4.1, 4.2. And uh, it, the neurotransmitter that connects the synapses, hence neurons in the reward center, the VTA, the nucleus accumbens, among others, that is all, dopamine plays a role there. And it's medications, bad medications can exhaust it, for example, and leaving you wanting or liking more. Uh, we talk about that in class, but no, I did not bring that detail to uh, today. Any other questions? Well, please thank Dr. Pierre Moore for coming here.